Who owns this? Ah, can you tell us what it is? Well, actually, that came from the Atlanta uh, transit system. It used to be back in the days when they made street cars. And it came out of their uh, carpentry shop, which you, you remember street cars had a lot of woodwork on it. Right. And that is actually used to set the teeth on the bandsaw blade. Right. Uh, you put them in there, and you turn the crank. If he could get a close-up of it, as you turn it, you can see that uh, when you turn the crank, it has an arm that advances the uh, bandsaw blade, and then it has a, you might call it a set or a handle on each side. There's the advance. It uh, sets the teeth. The two sets. Well, and it is adjustable. I didn't have a, a bandsaw blade that was suitable to use in that today, so I didn't bring a bandsaw blade to go in. <coughs> It has a little two pieces on each side that you can adjust the center of the blade and different thickness blades. Some of these things were so complex that you'd look at one and you'd think to yourself, how did they have the smarts back then? I'm talking turn of the century uh, and maybe 25 years before 1900 and up to about 1930. Uh, some of the stuff like the saw sets, the gummers, uh, had more whistles and bells in them than you could possibly believe, but they worked quite well. By the way, anybody that has a question, just uh, ask it. I'm what I'd like to say about it is it, I'm sure that it worked well with the bandsaw blades that they made at that time, but I've tried it on a modern blade and it don't work that well because the teeth are so hard you bend them, they break off. Uh huh. It's a good point. Uh, we'll pick up this one. This is a nice tool. It's old. Uh, and who belongeth to this? You do. And since you told me what it is, tell the group what it is. Uh, I think they have various names. To me, they're turpentine hooks. That's what you cut the slash, the face on mm -hmm. uh, pine tree, so the sap would run. This one's actually in pretty good condition. I understand uh, <laughs> they ask uh, what do you call people who did this in uh, North Carolina and nobody could come up with the answer? The answer is Tar Heel, but I said Rednecks. <laughs> I was not popular with anybody from that area for a long time. Uh, uh, here's a couple of what's it, I have no idea. Who belongs to these? I brought those in and I have no idea either. <laughs> yeah. If you're a tool collector, when you don't know the answer, it's called a what's it. Yeah. And I have no idea what the what's it is. So we'll... Let's go ahead and pass those around and we'll... All right, that's a good idea. Maybe somebody has the answer. Uh, I've seen this before. Who belongs to the... You belong... Do you know what this is? Yeah. Tell me what it is. I've forgotten. Can you borrow your saw? It's called a clear line. Right. And it fastens on right. the wooden handle. And as you move the handle up and down, there's a plunger in there. Can you hear it? And, and it blows it. The seals are gone, but it's supposed to generate a little puff of air that blows the sawdust away from your line. Right. <laughs> so this is, this is Actually, guys. <laughs> This thing is quite collectible and it's quite rare for obvious reasons. Uh, not everybody bought one from the dime store. I'll pass that thing around. That's a good piece. Uh, Stanley Hale made a whole bunch of these things. This is called a 192. They made a 190, 191. It was a series and they were different widths. Uh, they make a great shoulder plane. So. We'll, we'll get it going. Boy, we've got a couple here that are superb. Start with this one. Anybody know what this is? Besides the guy that owns it? You do? What is it? Well, it's it used a planar radius in the board. That's correct. It's called a core box. Uh, this one is in really quite good condition. It's not a rare plane, but it's uncommon because pattern makers and uh, people in those different fields were the only ones actually that probably ever used one of these things. It actually came with three sets of wings, so 
it would be up about this high and these turnbuckles are always missing. Uh, so you could put a, another set of wings and it would come up about like that. This one, as I said, is in absolutely superb condition. What did you say you did with it? Sir? What did you say you did with it? Oh, uh, you want to explain that? Well, I can do it better going a little bit. All right. Always take advantage of someone who knows what they're doing. Well, I, I've never used one of them, but I just happen to know what it is. Actually, they work quite well. I've tried one. Yeah. I mean, if you had a piece of wood, it probably worked best with the grain than, than across the grain. But you can imagine this: if you needed, if you needed to plane this, for example, right here, if you can look at that plane, if you started anywhere on here, for example, right here, where you cut it here, and that plane would be like this. You could start here, and you can see as you plane this away a Keep little bit at the time. Way you would eventually wind up down here like this with this. And as long as you worked off of these two points here, then the way the plane is designed, that cutter would, you know, it would come in here in any, any way that you put it, as long as you work between these two points, which is going to be your right. goal for uh, making a radius or making a how deep can you win like that? Would it be like a equal to like a router cut or something like that? How what? How deep can you go? Well, down you can go as deep as the as, as the, the wings. wings are wide on. That's pretty deep. Pretty deep, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you understand what I'm talking yeah. about, yeah, yeah, I see about that. that. The wider the wings, the deeper you can go with it. So you have to remember, they didn't have anything that turned up to 20,000 RPM when these were being used. <laughs> <laughs> The um, <laughs> that is essentially no, correct. <laughs> That's essentially correct, but I, I do have the Stanley original instructions with it. Plus, yeah. uh, Stanley said to at your outside points to start with a saw curve and waste the middle right. with a chisel or if you don't use that to. And I don't guess we've got any retired founder men in here, but. If you're making a casting, typically iron can be any metal, uh, if it has a hole in it, you have a core print. And it rests in, it's a circular device, generally. And that's what makes, you, sand molds are soft, they're rammed up, but they'll fall apart when, when you shake out the casting. But core prints have a binder in the sand, and they're baked so that you can pour around them without destroying them. And this makes the, the round sections where the core print sits in, in the uh, coat and the drag. So the same guy that's told us what this is used for, uh, brought this piece in. This is a very, very nice collectible. It's worth actually quite a bit of money. That one is worth, in uh, today's market, somewhere between, I don't want, you want me to tell you what I think it's worth? Yeah. Because I, I don't want to hurt your feelings. No, I'm, I'm way out of touch with the market. Okay. Well, the market has gone down, and I'm not yeah. going to talk about that, but that's worth probably between 300 and, and 450 bucks. Used to be five, I but, think. Yeah, this piece right here is worth today probably about 800. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called a floor plane. Stanley made a couple of versions of this. But this piece right here is the piece that you can't find and in 25 years I've seen maybe two of these complete they came with two handles and you would put the handle in this end stick this heavy thing on the floor and plane if you can imagine that um, that had to be a lot of work but this is really a this is really a nice interesting piece I, my uh, mentor worked for Stanley, and he seemed to think, he wasn't quite old enough. But what was his name? Fred Curry. Oh, I knew Fred. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, he was, he turned into a pretty rabid. Oh, uh, that's an understatement. <laughs> and, and, uh, and he and his wife were my children's godparents, but oh. Fred got pretty rabid. Did you ever get in his house? I lived next door. 
Uh, he actually put supports under his house because he had so much Stanley, which is metal. I changed the geosynchronous position. I mean, satellites <laughs> would go over his house and go crazy. A few years before Fred died, you couldn't get through the downstairs room. Yeah, he was. And uh, he sold off a bunch of planes and put $22,000 in five planes. Yeah, well, that wouldn't surprise me at all. I knew the guys that bought a lot of that stuff from him. Uh, here we have a spoke shave. Uh, I don't know exactly what this one's used for. Do you know? Who's here? I brought that in. That was my father's, and I knew what it was. I'm curious how to, how to put handles on it to make it usable or functional. I assume it didn't have wooden handles that worked on it? Yeah, you have to take the hooks, so you, hate them, rebend them out. Put your handle on, and these were to hold the handles on. It's actually in not bad condition. You could clean it up. It's and, actually got a pretty good edge on it, just as is. Yeah, and resharpen it. Uh, I love this tool. How many know what this thing is for? Four nails. Ah, that's right. Uh, they made a lot of these things, and actually, they were quite utilitarian. They would pull a nail out, no doubt about it. And pinch your hand too. Then what? Pinch your hand when you slide oh, the rim. I don't even want to think about it. That, that looks dangerous. I'm next to the next to the oldest tool in my shop. I got it from my dad. Mm. I got, uh, I was, I'm the oldest tool and now I got it. From my dad. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably the most common. They were all shaped similar to this, but the Red Devil is the name on. Uh, a lot of this stuff about tools I just picked up by osmosis. My uh, forte was Stanley, and uh, that's a nice set of pinchers. Do you know what these are for? No, that, that's the thing. They look like nail pours, but they're not round. But they're not. And, and they're also flat on one side. They're probably, they're probably yeah, and they have a gap in them, so. Yeah. Oh, uh, they made about six gazillion different types of these things. And I just really have no idea what this particular set was used for. Hey, he, oops. He's got a suggestion here what he thinks it is, and I think he's right. What? When you shot a horse. It's a barrier. Bingo! That's a good, yeah, you didn't want them to close all the way, just enough to get the head in. That's a good, a good answer. That nail puller that you picked up there a while ago, they were yeah. also made with a sliding ram. Right. That was what that one, that one has a That one's good. That's sliding. He didn't show up. That one has a ram. He's saying people back then, you know, when you look at their tools compared to what you see today, uh, they don't look very utilitarian. But trust me, if they if they weren't rare tools, rare means they weren't used. Uh, so that's one of the things I'm going to talk about in some of these tools. <coughs> For instance, wood planes, uh, you think that they were hard to use, they weren't. They cut so beautifully, it's, if you ever use a hand plane and try one, it will impress you. <coughs> but here we have a handmade scraper, looks like it's, I don't know if that's a carbide piece in it, but how many of you guys use scrapers? I'll tell you, that is probably one of the better kept secrets in the wood shop. I have scrapers on my desk, I almost quit using sandpaper. This is a nice one. I don't know where I acquired it from, but I acquired it in this handy. Well, it's a good piece. Uh, it's not rare. It's not really collectible, but uh, it's a good user. You tried it? Yeah. Yeah, it works great. Uh, here's another what's it. Who knows what this is? Who owns this thing? Oh, I do. You do? Yeah, and, and uh, we've passed it around once before, and I think the group opinion was it may have been used for uh, uh, working on campus. Uh, sewing or something like that. You can see that. Yeah, I can see. You know what? That's probably could have been used like on a boat. Yeah. That's a. Looks like it's you know homemade. You'd probably win first place at the what's it at one of my meetings. <laughs> <laughs> this belongs to. You know what it is? I just was a scraper. Right? It's a scraper. Oh, I acquired it at a thrift shop for a couple of dollars. Stanley made uh, several of these, several different configurations. Uh, this is a really early one, as noted by this. The heads were pretty much the same. Is that an 82? Um, sorry? Is that an 82? I'm sorry? Is that a number 82? I think you're right. 
You see, yeah, can you see an 82 on that thing? Yeah. Right there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. I used to have all these things in the box. Uh, some really interesting ones were made by Leonard Bailey early on before he joined the Stanley Club. I know this piece. This looks like a, it's not a sergeant, but it's a hand scraper. Put your hand over it like that and you could pull it or you could turn the blade around and push it for the pull. Uh, they made a gazillion different types of these things. Stanley made one and that one happens to be incredibly collectible also. What else have we got here? That's uh, the, we have a the plane. Of large the, the oh, plane. this one. For the guy from England. <laughs> England is where most of the great tools came from. Uh, the Scottish people made some very, very nice uh, hand planes. This is called a plow plane, uh, a handled plow plane. Uh, they made a lot of them with the handle would be cut off and you just put your hand on the back side of it. They normally came with six or eight irons. The iron rides on a skate and they were different widths. Uh, this one's in pretty nice condition. And anybody have a question about it? <coughs> I just had to say the workmanship and craftsmanship uh, that yeah, I can so tell you a little story about this. About 1900, there was a company called Chapin Stevens, and uh, Chapin bought out the Stevens Company, and they manufactured uh, wood planes, plow planes. Back then, you worked 10 hours a day, and if you were a grunt, you made 10 cents or less an hour. That's something you want to remember when I'm talking about some of these tools. The most expensive worker in the factory was the guy that made plow planes. And he could make between six and eight of these a day, complete. Uh, he didn't cast, of course, the metal parts, but he could turn all these screws, turn these. These are uh, boxwood nuts. This is, this is, looks like pear wood or boxwood. Uh, it would clean up beautifully. Anyway, uh, so he could make six of these to eight of these a day and he got about a dollar and seventy cents for the day. And remember, that was a ten hour day. What is that for to cut grooves along the end of the board? Yeah, it's for cutting uh, rabbits. rabbits. Okay. And the more I've looked at this over the years, I've actually tried one. They actually work quite well, but there had to be an easier way. I would have used a shoulder plane or something else. Um, Maybe that's why so many of these still exist. Ken, did you know Tom Ward? Yes, I did. Very short period of time before he passed away. I just got into collecting when he was the first president of Midwest Tool Com uh, Collectors Association. His death, I think he said the kids sold 160 different plow planes. Sir? See, at his death, I think the kids sold like 160 plow planes. He had some nice ones. Oh yeah, I got a friend that lives over in Louisiana, just one for $75,000. Of course, it was a, a one of a kind. It was in beyond pristine. Uh, I can't even remember who made the thing. And I wanted to collect those when I first got started until I found out what the good ones were going to cost. <laughs> they cost a lot of money. Well, what would that be worth in that division? Today's market, yeah. you should keep it. Oh, yeah. yeah, there's no. Uh, ten years ago, you probably could have got 150 for it. Okay. I can tell you all the reasons why. Uh, now, if it happened to have a really good name on the front of it, like so collectors collect two things in these: they collect the name, or they collect condition, because they don't have it. So if it's in good condition, it's got to have a good name before they're interested in it, before it'll bring any money. So what is a name worth? Well, there's one called C.E. Chilor, Living in Rentham, and uh, he was the slave of uh, John Nicholson, uh, that's spelled I instead of J, 
And when he was emancipated, he went into, or freed, he was, um, went into business for himself making planes. So if you happen to see one that says C.E. Chilor, living in Rentham, you have, depending on what it is and its condition, it's worth three to eight thousand dollars just because of the name. Uh, the guy Nicholson, uh, his aren't quite that expensive, but you need a deep pocketbook at some point. Yeah, one other plane up there, the uh, Sash plane, or is this in? Uh, uh, it's just called a plow. This? I said I've got another plane, it's not broad. Oh, this one here. Oh, 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 yeah. <clears throat> These are, uh, fortunately, this one is in what we would call fair condition. We rate our tools by uh, how close to new are they. Uh, I would make the statement to you there's no such thing as a new plane. However, I've had some a plane that was 170 years old. I spent three days looking at it under a loop because I thought somebody would re-nickled this thing. They hadn't. It was 99.5% it was new. Those are rarities within themselves when they get to be over 60 or 70 years old. And when you get back to 100 years or 150 years, that's an incredible find. So this would be a fair plane. Uh, it's great to look at. It's really not collectible. I am. Uh got it because it was real cheap at uh, the flea market and uh, what, I, what I like is that you know somebody used that I don't know how many years ago uh -huh. uh, but it's for making the uh, for in the windows right and I made one side of one piece of wood <laughs> Put it on the job. that was hard work I can't yeah. imagine going out on site and having to build all of the uh, the I'll tell you what, at our right? age, you guys want to have a little fun. You get a piece of uh, cherry or walnut. You want it to be about that long, about that thick, about that wide, and hopefully it'll have a knot in it and it'll be slightly wrapped, <laughs> which means it's twisted. And then you flatten that little hand plane on all four sides. And I can tell you right now, you will never, ever attempt it in a lifetime. And that's even goes for the young man sitting back there. That is, can you imagine being uh, a novice in a shop back around uh, 1870, and your job was to flatten the top of the boards for tables and so forth? You, you would have, you'd have been built like Iron Mike. You can't figure out if you did one side, how do you get the other side? You know, how do you secure the board? <laughs> one thing I've uh, also found about uh, using wood planes, uh, they're not simple to use. They require a lot of thought. You've got to know what the strike angle is. You've got to know how to take the wood off to get down to a, a particular profile, for instance, on a crown molding. Uh, but they work so well, they're joy to use. The, the wood just peels off. It's, it's incredible. Uh, I think we got two more over here, and I happen to. Got one on the corner of the bench there, that piece of wood. Oh. Oh, oh I wondered. <laughs> Tuning fork? Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, you tell it's us. It's homemade uh, duplicate or serves the same purpose as a standing piece. As a what? He's got me. It's uh, the, the uh, name I had was heard when I got that, and that's not very old, probably six or seven years. It's a preacher. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to leave that one alone, but go ahead. <laughs> Stanley called it, I think it was a number 100 siding gauge, where you struck a line on the siding cut. No, nope. the number doesn't ring a bell. Yeah, let me, I can sketch it better than I can describe it. Uh, <coughs> if you were building a house and putting siding on it. Clapboard gauge. Okay. You, this is a corner board or a barge board. And your siding butts into this. Right. This straddles it. 
and if you strike this line, that's your end cut. Right. Stanley made a little gadget that did the same thing with about four or five fingers that you only moved like three right. quarters of an inch that left you a cut yeah, line. I know what you're talking about. <coughs> but, but quite honestly, I've forgotten the number. They made two clapper gauges. The one you're talking about. I couldn't and find another it. Brought it with <laughs> yeah, holding the boards up. We got two other ones over here. Uh, I happen to love this plane right here. This is a Stanley 112 uh, scraper plane. And uh, who belongs to this thing? I think we brought to the other Way in the back. Uh, okay, what's well, obvious you haven't used it. You know what it's for? Yeah. Yeah. You can take off as much wood with this you won't believe how much wood you can take off with it. I like it because it's got a big flat surface and it's easy to push and it's easy to adjust the hook so that you get the sweet spot by moving these little knobs back here. Um, that tool, in that condition, uh, there's a lot of woodworkers that really love this thing. So this will probably bring you up somewhere over 200 bucks if you were to sell it on eBay. And they're very popular, so it's not a problem selling them. Any questions? Let, let, let me just make one observation. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, I gotta say it, devil that I have. All right. <laughs> what a what a great program today. A program on old tools for old woodworkers who <laughs> are still wondering Speak for yourself. if there's any edge left on us, if there's any usefulness still left in us, and can we be refurbished to be useful again. That's a tremendous, that's a tremendous message there, and I just had to throw it. Well, I'm so happy you did, because I feel exactly the same way. Amen. Amen. Did you pick up an offering then? <laughs> and last but not least is the equivalent of a Stanley 45 made by Sargent. Uh, missing all of the blades. Um, but um, what happened with the transition from wood, and that's one of the things I'm going to talk about, when you went from the wood planes which would be around 1850 up to about 1870s when they started uh, to quit using wood planes and go to the transitionals or the metallic planes. Uh, Stanley and, and then Sargent, Sargent was a competitor of Stanley's, uh, Stanley came out with one called the Stanley 45 and the idea behind that was uh, a Finnish cabinet maker would generally have uh, cabinet maker's tool chest and in that he would have somewhere around a hundred woodworking planes. Some chisels, some saws, uh, some scrapers, that kind of thing. And Stanley determined that they could come up with a plane uh, and at one point it had 27 cutters uh, to replace all of those tools. And it was a very utilitarian plane. It actually works. I, uh, I did a, a tongue and groove with this. It worked very well. It was easy to set up. The complex molding that you would try with this, you just about had to be a mechanical engineer uh, because there's a lot of setup. There was a lot of tuning as you got down into the profile and so forth. And then along came <laughs> the Stanley 55. The Stanley 55 was patterned after the 45. It had 52 cutters. It weighed 24 pounds. It was a nightmare to use. And consequently, you see lots of them in almost pristine condition in the box. <laughs> so I cut a tongue and groove, one tongue and groove, and then I went over to my router table and finished off the rest of my boards because it's, it's borders on the ridiculous and it you know you know one of the problems we have using hand tools particularly where they require force is we don't have the muscle mass anymore you know we're getting older I mean you do 30 minutes of shoving a plane down a board and you'll be panting and looking for a chair or I would have <laughs> so, it's a nice plane and it's uh, sergeant is 
uh, fairly scarce to collect. I had thought about collecting that before Stanley until I found out that for some reason not a lot of sergeant tools exist and not a lot of pristine sergeant <coughs> tools exist. So that's our show and tell. Any questions? I have an old Stanley Walker shaper, half inch tilting arbor, old Stanley Walker. I don't know where it came from. I can't find out where it came from. Tommy and I have looked at it, but it has a huge motor, the kind that you adjust with the washer, uh -huh. but it has a tilting arbor on it. Uh, massive table, weighs a half a ton, and uh, uh, it's a horse. It had double bushings on it. And so Industrial grade. It goes way back, I don't know, 75 years old or so. I understand it might have been from the, uh, I think, uh, Walker Turner. Yeah, Stanley invented the uh, shaper, the, the router plane, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then this other fella came along and invented the electric router. And so they combined forces, I suspect, maybe. No, Stanley bought Walker Turner. I was thinking that might be a transition. I don't know what it did. I, I can't. I can't find much on it. Can't find much on it. Go online. Well, I, uh -huh. I I'm like an. I'm like an old uh, tool man. I don't know how to use that. Get thing. you six years. That'd be a good idea. I got the trust you. I used to have. I'm not going to get into that. Any other? Go ahead. Who owns it? I do. Well, I delivered newspapers for four years as a kid. Um, I think it was 55 years ago. The route man who used to drop drop off the bales of paper for the carriers carried one of them in his change apron, which looked like what we call a nail apron, that he cut the wire on the bales. Uh, that was the Pittsburgh Press. Sounds good to me. To me, all that is just an early wire cutter. <coughs> small and convenient. The other tool that's going around with that is a can opener. Mm -hmm. Still made today like that. Oh, yeah? What in the world is this? It's an opener. A can opener. Is there something missing yeah. on it? No, it's still made like that today. You just move the handle back and forth and it'll ratchet. That ratchet goes that ratchet that ratchet around the edge of the can. You know what? That's worth looking up on eBay also. Yeah. Uh, that looks like it could be a very rare can opener. I wish I had time I'd tell you a story about cannabis. Uh, you want to get started on these two? Okay. Uh, what I had planned on, what time we got to get? You just yell when I can. No, but that's great. When, uh, we normally when they do, start leaving and yeah, falling asleep. We normally stop at 9.30, okay. so when people start migrating out, keep talking. Okay. Uh, when, when you got an empty classroom. I had this idea a few years ago. After, uh, uh, I had a guy come down into my basement. I had 18 years of. I had 18 years of uh, collecting Stanley. I was very avid at it. Uh, when other people were watching TV, I was studying Stanley. And then, of course, because I, I was fortunate enough to go to a lot of national and international tool shows and area meetings and become associated with guys who. Uh, wrote books, they were very scholarly about uh, the different tools. I learned, as you can tell, I learned something about a lot of tools, but uh, I used to know quite a bit about Stanley. Anyway, I sold this collection to this guy and he took everything. I mean, I didn't keep anything. So I decided I'd get back into woodworking, which I had left to get into collecting. And a few years ago, I met some guys called the Society of American Period Furniture Makers. And these guys are world-class furniture makers. They make museum-quality furniture from scratch. Uh, they do their own turning, their own carving. They do it, but the finishes are to kill for. They are absolutely superb craftsmen. And they knew something about tools from the practical side. I knew something about tools from the collecting side, and those two uh, believe it or not, kind of meld together. So my idea was today was to kind of give you a, a history and a chronology of how tools are developed. And we have a young man back here, and I'm glad to see him. 
because that's really what this little talk is about. I'm just going to tell you right up front what it's about. Don't buy used old tools. Buy 21st century tools because they are far, far superior. I'm going to try to prove that to you. So we start off, I got a date up here, uh, Sargent. They started in business in 1884 and went out in 1964. Stanley started in 1855 and they're still in business. And Diston started uh, about 1840. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Diston saws first. Um, here's a very nice example of a 170 year old saw. Now these are quite rare because Remember I told you these guys work 10 hours a day, so this would not have been on site. This would have been more on site. So these guys would use these saws all day long, and they were uh, designed to be incredibly functional. If you were doing a lot of, uh, if you're cutting in the south, the teeth could be slightly different than they would be in the north, and ad nauseum, it gets, goes on and on. Uh, but the quality of the saw was fantastic. And what these guys would do during lunchtime, they'd sit out there and they would file their saws until they got down to looking like keyhole. Oops, I've actually seen them look just like a keyhole saw. So to find a good old saw is incredibly difficult. This one is uh, actually over 170 years old. And the way I know that is the way the saw blade is put in. This was probably uh, pruning saw and it was made in France. He's got the camera set right above you, so right you just straight down from the camera. It shows up on here. Oh, okay. So if you can keep it in that same area, that way you don't have to hold it around so much. And... Oh, I can just point to it. Yeah. yeah, you just have to. The saw that I just picked up is about 170 years old, and I'm not going <coughs> to go into why I know it's 170 years old. Uh, one of the interesting things about this 170 year old saw is it had spring steel in it. Can't make this one do a tune. Had a little nib on it. If anybody wants to know what that is, I happen to know. Yes. Huh? What is it? The nib. The nib was nothing more than a decoration. <laughs> According to Henry Diston, and I'll take his word for it. Um, but this saw was hand, at some point was hand ground, so it has, it's thicker at the teeth and thinner here. You can actually feel the taper. It's also tapered from the handle down to the toe, 170 years old. This was done on a stone that could be 13 inches wide and up to 7 feet in diameter. And they would have literally hundreds of these things in line in the district factory. The uh, operations to produce a saw, I won't bore you with those because that's not the point I want to make. This is a, a Simons. The, we had Henry Diston, uh, we had Simons uh, also on the East Coast, and we had Atkins. And Atkins uh, was up in uh, Indiana. Where was Diston? Diston was also on the East Coast, and since this that was not my real area, I know something about him because I got a buddy here who has a world-class collection of Diston. He also has probably four thousand five-dollar saws. This also was tapered, hand ground, front to back. The teeth were originally cut uh, with a machine, and then they were hand filed. And I have a piece of information for you that you'll take home and never forget. Uh, about 1864, uh, uh, Henry had the first uh, crucible steel mill in the United States. And he started making his own blades. And because of the amount of hand sharpening involved, uh, he also decided he would make files. And the reason for that is, according to his book, uh, he used 30,000 dozen triangular files a year in his own business. And remember, fellas, that's three sides on that file. So 
Who's the mathematician? <laughs> That's a lot of files. So the point is that not everything back then should be discarded. The saws were used up, they were turned into scrapers, uh, they were turned into knife blades, all kinds of things. So good ones are hard to find. They were very labor intensive. So we get out of the wood plains and we get into uh, an area that, where we began to transition into the metallic plains. Uh, I think all of mine are fortunately English <laughs> in honor of our guest today. Uh, so this is called an English infill. This one looks like rosewood. Uh, they work so well, it's unbelievable. You really have to try one of these things. There's a little trick to fettling one of these. That's a, another English term which means to tune it up. Uh, you strike it on the toe or on the sole and the blade will move and you can cock it back and forth until you get a nice fine closure in the mouth. These became very popular between 1850 and the turn of the century. They were called infills. Uh, they're heavy. Uh, they had really thick irons. Some of them had actually had a tapered iron that was very thick at the front. Uh, again, uh, you had to learn how to get it fettled and take the time to do it, but uh, they work quite well. And the mass is one of the things. I used to like, uh, this is my First plane, Stanley number three, C. It's light. Uh, frankly, it's not a very good plane. But these things, once you get them moving, um, they do a great, and get the mouth and iron adjusted, they do a great job. You might point out most of those in good condition go for about the price of a 10 inch cabinet saw, right? Yeah. Uh, the one we're going to finally end up talking about is one up there. Uh, at some point, a company called Norris came out with what they called the Norris Adjuster. I'm going to show you an example of that on a 21st century tool. It was a very, very fine adjustment. Uh, what would you typically use that plane for, what application? Uh, they came, they were bench planes, so you'd have a, a one for the bench. Uh, I see in England, we call it a jointer over here. They called it a triplane over there, just a matter of difference in terminology. That would have been a longer plane. Uh, about the longest one they made, as I recall, was 22 inches. It would normally have been. Uh, these actually were, they priced themselves out of the market on, the, on these planes because they were very expensive. And when we get back to, I don't know what they were making at that time, uh, but at 10 cents an hour, you wouldn't want to pay $150 for a plane to use on site. So I, I get the feeling that the majority of them were used by hobbyists, although hobbyists, uh, Stanley and these other companies weren't manufacturing tools for hobbyists before the 19th century. We'll get to that one in a second. This one is a Sargent Auto Set. The reason I bought these tools was I wanted to try them. I wanted to find out what made them tick. Were they really good tools? And overall the answer is no. Why? Well, I believe the answer is they were made for utility reasons. Um, how am I going to put this? In other words, they weren't made for picky hobbyists. Uh, back then they didn't polish the back side of the blade. Uh, they had an old Arkansas stone. They hit it a couple times, a couple fried on the front, and went at it. Uh, but they were, because they did it frequently, like every day, they became, the tools did the job, and that was the end of the story. Uh, we have a tendency to get a little pickier uh, with our uh, <coughs> hobby tools. This is uh, st one of Stanley's transitional planes. Um, again, I bought it to try and see how well it worked. It works really well. It 
Uh, the trick here is to find one that's got a mouth that's not that wide. But again, once you get this thing tuned up, there's something about wood sliding across wood that just, it has a good feel. This is a gauge plane made in Vinland, New Jersey, and Stanley bought these people out. That's apple wood. And the reason it's apple wood is because there was an apple wood orchard behind his workshop where he made these things. These guys were really frugal. Uh, they were great businessmen, and they were fans. Some of them, like Stanley was, and Distant, were fantastic when it came to marketing their product. So, and then we get up to what I call the pretty tools. Um, our friend in the back from England will like this piece here. This is called a Markle's Ultimatum. I had to have one. They're very, very expensive. Have a very nice piece of ivory in the top. Uh, this happens to be rose, rosewood. Yeah, rosewood. Uh, it's called a plated brace or an infilled brace. And the guy that sold this to me, his name was Reg Eaton, and he was from England. Um, these can run anywhere from, if they're pretty much junky, 350 bucks up to about 1500 And then there are braces that run up in the $20,000 range. I noticed that's got a square uh, bit part to it. Is that what I said? Yeah, um, and that's why I brought these things. This is called a gents brace or ladies brace because it's small. Uh, it happened to come with this. I thought you might be interested in some of the boring tools. No, it's okay. Let me... Uh, thanks. Uh, there are one, two, three different sets of bits in here. One of these are like for making chairs, except mine are not wide enough to put a chair spindle in. That's this one right here. You see the kind of round edge? This one up here has a funny little hook on it, and that was actually designed to bore down through the end grain. So uh, the development of, of bits is, is also an interesting uh, history, and there are a lot of other different types beside these. Uh, these are called center point bits, for the obvious reason, they have a really huge center point, and they work similar to uh, the Russell Jennings and uh, the Irwin twist bits with the leads on the screw up on the end. Uh, and then a couple of extra pieces, this one, and countersink. And they fit. And this one, we have a spring that holds by a little, a little clamp. And you put it in the end like this and tighten it up and go to town. And you would think that uh, that they wouldn't work very well. The fellas, they did. They worked really well. Uh, that's the, one of the interesting things I found about old tools. Uh, can you still get bits like that? You can buy them because... Uh, I mean over the counter. No. no. Uh, you can buy the chair bits. Uh, they probably sell them here. They were a little shorter, they're designed a little bit differently, and they're obviously designed to cut a bigger hole with. These are marking gauges. Uh, this is a, uh, something interesting I found out for myself. I loved, this is uh, Markle's, made in England. This one doesn't have a maker's mark on it, but I just, it has a beautiful piece of ebony in it. Uh, it's nice and heavy, it's a slitting gauge. Uh, when I got interested in doing uh, stringing and uh, inlay, uh, dovetails, I need a good slitting gauge. Um, so I started at my tool shows, I started looking for these things. And lo and behold, I found that 999 out of 1,000 marking gauges, I don't care what, how far back they were made or whether they were reasonably new, I had the two little points and they were for scratching a mortise and a tenon. That's unbelievable. So if you looked at a thousand, you might find 
10, 15, 20 of these things. Uh, a slitting gauge is, for those of you who have used it, you know now that it's absolutely invaluable. Uh, it produces, a, it's like a strike knife, it produces a, a super fine line, it doesn't tear uh, the fibers. And if you want to get, if you're shooting for the utmost accuracy, this is a handy little tool to have around. It's also feels good and it's pretty and it works. So I use these tools. And then we have spoke shaves. This one happens to be a fairly rare called Cantello. It would open and had a little lever over here so that you could close it down into a a slide. Remember it. Don't think the tool. Uh, um, so then we get up to current tools. How many recognize the profile? Bedrock? Is that, is that an S? That's uh, called a bedrock. See the uh, flat top right. on it? It, it kind of looked like it was concave from back here. Uh, I've had the same problem looking at them on my monitor. And <clears throat> These were the Stanley bench planes, and this is a number three. They made a number one, which was totally useless. It was only five and a quarter inches long. But if you have one, it's worth eight hundred to fifteen hundred dollars because it's highly collectible. Made a two, a two C, a three, a three C, and it goes on and on and on up to a uh, Stanley number eight bench plane, which was twenty-four inches long. Uh, Supposedly, that was great for jointing a long board. How many of you have done that? Yeah. How many were successful at it? You were? Well, that's unusual. Because well, I, go ahead. If I'm trying to do decent joints, uh, I join them on the joiner. Right. The power joiner. Right. I'm running an old new one. And uh, then I will dress them. But that eight is just too much weight. I use a number seven with with a fence on it. Yeah, well, okay. What he's talking about there is that uh, the six and the seven were shorter versions of the eight, and you could uh, clamp on, Stanley made one called the 386. It was a fence, and you could adjust the fence, and you could adjust it to 90 degrees. But if you were doing it by hand, and you only did it once a year, what would happen is, with me, I put a little pressure to the right side, so I'm not planing a 90 degree, I'm cocked over just a hair. By the time you get all that figured out, you throw that board away and you go to your jointer and you joint the blade. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing is true of uh, crosscut saws. To fi I file my own saws. To, uh, to file a crosscut, it has a very complex geometry. Um, I suggest you go to your table saw, turn it on, and make the cut. Uh, as far as ripping with these saws, again, why? But if you're doing dovetails, this is an early English whoops, open handle saw. They made them in closed handle. I have one that's six inches long, very rare because it was useless. Try cutting with a six inch saw. Your stroke looks like this, you know. Uh, so I use an either an 8 or a 10, I happen to like the open handle, until I ran into the 21st century saw. So, these are highly copied today by guys like Lee Nielsen. Lee Valley makes great planes. Uh, Stanley just recently came out with a line of planes. Uh, I'm not going to make any comments about what I think about those planes, or some of the other planes, because I don't want to affect it. Uh, this, you're, I'm here by the courtesy of the owner of this place. Um, so we're at that point where you say to yourself, you're into flea market. That's how I got started collecting. That's my first plane. That's my first collectible plane. I had just bought a record from England. <laughs> and uh, this is at least 40 years ago, and as I recall, by the time I got it, it cost me just under a hundred bucks. It was a number five because I thought that was the most utilitarian. 
size, and I eventually bought uh, one that was equivalent to this number three. And I'm going through a, a flea market over in North Carolina, and lo and behold, there sat this plane. And my wife was with me. I'd never collected or bought anything like that. I asked the guy, I said, where you got a hand for that thing? And he said, 20 bucks. I just found a heaven. So I bought it. That was my first mistake. <laughs> my second mistake, and I turned to my wife and I said, honey, <laughs> I wonder if I could find a number eight. Because at that time, a number eight record was over 200 bucks plus shipping. Well, and then I went into a place up in Marietta, Marietta Hardware, Allen Sellers. And Allen had a huge collection of antique tools by trade. I went home and I told my wife, I said, I don't know what you're going to collect, but I'm going to collect tools. Gave up the woodwork, <coughs> started the tool collecting, and got into Stanley, and one thing led to another, and at some point I had about 700 pieces of Stanley in the box, rare, complete, and so forth. Anybody want to know anything about it? you have any questions about collecting? <laughs> don't. <laughs> And then along came eBay, and so what I do now is I use my knowledge to buy rare tools. And I have, I pick for two guys who have a lot of money. And so I buy rare stuff in wonderful condition for them. So, where are we? Okay, so well, then we get up to... You the, mentioned earlier you didn't think much of the 3C. Is that the, the whole range, year range of them, or just the basic plane? All of them. And I, it's not that they're bad planes. Remember now, I, I mentioned early on, and you may have let it go by, uh, in the good old days, these were utilitarian planes. Mm -hmm. They were used in the field, they were used in shops, and the guys that used these used them year after year, and they became comfortable with them, and they could make them do what they needed to do. And that doesn't, whether it, it was a, guy by the name of Studley, or whether it was just some guy that did some uh, flattening work in, in a cabinet shop. So they were made to work. I'm going to use our young new member back here as an example. He goes out and he says, ah, there's a Stanley 3C and it's only $20. I'll buy that because it's cheap. Uh, I'm full of these homilies. The remembrance of quality lives on long after price is forgotten. It's better to have one good tool than five bad ones. And go on and on and on. So he brings this thing home and now he spends the next five years trying to make it work right. He's got to flatten the sole. That does certain things to the mouth. The cheeks on these older planes 99.9% .9 of the time are never squared to the sole. So you try that. The frogs don't meet the bed. And you can go on and on and on about the nomenclature of this plane. If you play around with it long enough, you can get it where it will do an acceptable job. Or you can buy one good 21st century tool. And I'm going to pick on the saw first. Uh, saws are kind of like watching cement set, you know, uh, a saw. I don't use saws very much. If you're into hand tools and you're into hand cut dovetails, then at some point, and my philosophy by the way is this, if you have deep pockets and you can afford a $6,000 band saw, buy it. I can't. So I had to hit a happy medium, which I did, and I've made my tool work. That's the other thing you have to remember. When you buy a tool in here, the manufacturer sends you a good tool, but you have to make it do what you want to do on it. Am I right or wrong? Any comments? Any, uh, anybody dissent? <laughs> no? Well, we got a bunch of, too, what is it, too soon old, too late smart? Well, I think we're reversed here. We got a bunch of smart people. So, you can buy a saw for $65, you can buy one for about $125, or you can do what I did. I hate to even admit this. 
You can pay $250 for a toilet bowl saw. I call this my toilet bowl saw because of the handle. Now why would I do that? Well, because I cut a lot of dovetails. And by a lot, I mean I've probably cut over 2,000 of them in the last five years. That's a lot of dovetails. And I saw something in this saw, and because of my experience as a collector, and that's why I gave you the little talk on these saws, which are actually work very well and are incredibly well made. I bought this one for a reason. Is this the one you need to buy if you're that young man back there? If you have some money, I say yes, because it will do things that that little hand saw won't do. And I sharpen my own saw, so I know that this is uh, it's going to be used for ripping, and I know how to sharpen it, and I sharpen it where it does an incredibly good job. I'm not going to go into what makes this great saw, but when you pay 250 bucks for one, you've got to have a reason particularly if you know something about saws. And then I'm going to shock you just a little bit. For any questions? What's the Is anybody saying, you got to be nuts, because I have had a lot of my friends. What's the reason? Yeah, what are, what are the differences? Uh, the difference is, the guy that designed this took a lot of the problems uh, that you're not aware of if you cut dovetails with this type of saw, and put them into this saw. So first, it's heavy. And if I were teaching you to cut a dovetail, the first thing I would tell you is, relax your hand. We all have a tendency to get a death grip on our tools. And that does things to your muscles, and it will throw your saw off. <coughs> Anybody want to make a comment about that? Relax your hand. Same thing's true of a lot of your tools. You're gripping them way, way too hard. So you got to let the weight, you got to let the, uh, the tool do the work. That's one of the secrets to good woodworking, in my opinion. So this one has a very heavy spine. It's got a heavy handle. Uh, it's well hand sharpened. It's got one thing I really like. It has 22, yeah, 22 teeth per inch, and there's two inches of those right at the front. They're no set, which means the teeth don't go out like that. And this is absolutely wonderful for starting your saw on a, the pin of a dovetail, because that's the hard part to cut. It's got to fit into the tail. Once I can, can get you to see what with your eye where the saw needs to go, your brain can then tell your hand what to do. By relaxing your hand, you don't torque or move the saw away from where you want to start to cut. You can actually split a score mark with, with a marking. I guarantee you, that's how you do it. And when you get finished and you chop out the waist, you put the pin and the tails together and it fits. So that's why I spent that much money, because I wasn't, I had cut a lot of dovetails, but they didn't work where I wanted them to be. And so I tried this guy's saw and immediately saw the difference, and I said, I got to have one. Who's the manufacturer of that? Rob Cosman. So, it's, uh... Uh, so if you're, what I would tell you is this. Um, Lee Valley makes a great saw for 65 bucks. Lee Nielsen makes an even better saw for about 125 bucks. Not only is it a great saw, but it looks really good. And your tools should look good because that's part of <coughs> being a hobbyist. What about the current English makers? Uh, a lot of those make superb saws. Uh, but I, what I'm seeing in those uh, is I'm not seeing any real innovations. Uh, and that's why I blew that much. Fellas, I am not rich. But I spent that money because I've never regretted it since. And I've talked to half a dozen members. Mickey knows most of these guys uh, in the Society of American Period Furniture Makers into buying these things because they do work so well. Now here we have what? A coping saw. 
Is that Brave City? No. Uh, actually, I, mean, I can't even remember the name on it. It's crew. Uh, I if I put my glasses on, I could probably come up with a name. $100. Now you can buy these anywhere for 10 to 20 There's one out there somewhere in that range. And it's not that those saws won't do the job. It's if you cut a lot of dovetails. You don't want to run out and buy one of these unless you've got deep pockets. Or you know you're going to be cutting a lot of dovetails in the future. And what it has, it has a, it won't move. So it's got a cam up here that tightens up <coughs> this blade so that when I cut out the waist, this thing doesn't do that. I don't have a tension. You can put different tensions on it. I took one look at this and I said, as soon as I can come up with a hundred bucks, I'm gonna buy one of those things. I've never regret it. It's a wonderful tool. So you cut out your waist? Yeah, with this. Except on the uh, half blinds, you can't work. And then we get to last but not least. How are we doing for time, guys? Okay. Uh, last but not least is a hand plane. Uh, and again, if you've got deep pockets, buy the best one that you can find. Better yet, before you buy one, young man, talk to a bunch of people. See what they're using, why they're using. And then at least you can make uh, a knowledgeable decision. It won't necessarily mean that you made the right one at this time, but you'll be ahead of the game. And then five years from now, when you know where you're going with your wood, woodworking, if you've gone from making case stuff to chairs, you're probably not going to need a hand plane very much. Uh, if you're over there and Mickey's taught you to do chip carving, you need a plane, Mickey? Yeah, say you may not even need a plane. So don't go out and buy five planes. What? It doesn't have a motor. <laughs> I love that answer. <laughs> but you know what? In all seriousness, uh, a guy told me about 50 years ago, he said, you know what? He said you can buy all the tools in the world, but if you really want to get good with those power tools, get good with hand tools. Because then you'll know how and what you want to accomplish when you set your tool up. I happen to have a rigid table saw. It's not one of these nice, big, extensive saw stops, etc., etc., etc. However, I'll put mine up against anyone in this place who has one for being accurate in cutting. That's because I've spent an incredible amount of time fettling that saw, and it works wonderfully. Same thing's true of my drill press, my band saw, all of those things. You've got to get them where they do it for you. So back to the planes. I picked these two planes for a reason. And they don't sell them here. They don't sell them down the street. They don't sell them downtown. Why did I pick this? Well, I picked it based on 25 years of experience in collecting. <coughs> and I'm going to go through this one just a little bit and try to compare it a little bit with my Stanley number three. Remember I told you if you were to put a nice square up on this that probably the cheap was not square it sold? So you can't use it as a cheap board plane at all. Uh, is the sole flat in both planes? The answer is probably no. If you try to flatten this, the first thing you're going to find out is it's almost impossible to do that because you cannot put the same amount of pressure downward on each side of the plane, heel to toe, in order to get it flat. You're going to, I don't care what you're going to do, you're going to be off a little bit. That's going to open the mouth up. Then you've got to go through, you've got a really thin iron that chatters. Uh, it's probably not the best steel in the world in a used plane like this. The iron does not necessarily fit to the frog. This has a lot of slop in the vertical adjustment. Your horizontal adjustment's the same way. Uh, the lever cap works fine, but you have to tune the lead edge of it. You can just go on, 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 and on. And finally, you get it. And one of the most important things of all, how many in here know how important it is to close the mouth down 
so that you almost look at it and say, how's a chip get through that little bit? How many guys in here know, know what that means? One, two, three, a few. That gentleman, everybody says, get a sharp iron. Well, uh, what you want to do is close the mouth down. Uh, and what will happen, you'll find it, actually, if you've got a really good adjustment, you'll find that there's a sweet spot for the wood that you're working with, like curly cherry, curly maple, uh, and so forth. Look a little from this from Google here. Sorry? Okay. Uh, so you need a sharp iron. That's not a problem in today's market. You've got great sharpening tools. You've got lots of people that talk about it. Get the mouth closed down. Well, you can't do that with this. Well, you can. You got to come back here and try to get a screwdriver in here, unloosen some nuts up here, move this, and keep doing that until you finally get it closed down. Or you can come over to my plane with a Norris adjuster in it. And when I adjust my plane, and here we go, I move this little knob like this. See it move? You couldn't see it move if you were standing right up here next to me. Because every time I advance that, I move the iron in front. And I want to move that iron a thousandths at a time. So let's just talk quickly about what this thing has. First, it has an absolutely no. It has a 99.99% flat sole. This one does not have cheeks on it. But this is actually 90 degrees. I don't use this as a shoe board plane anyway. And that might be a drawback with this. Uh, the mouth opens and closes with this little adjustment right here. You unlock this and you can move the mouth back and forth. So I can move the mouth and I can move the iron in just little tiny increments. It's got an absolutely wonderful cap iron puts a lot of pressure right where it needs to be put, and that's in the front. My plane is a bevel up. It comes with four irons. That's a shortcoming with this plane. You can buy a, a frog in this. Does everybody know what the frog is? Anybody not care? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the frog is the thing that the iron lays down on. And historically, that's 45 degrees. So if you put an iron in there that has a 20 degree bevel, that's your cutting angle. It's 20 degrees. If you have a bevel up, mine is 12 degree bed. I'm using a 38 degree beveled iron. The standard is 25. I put it down. I add the 12 to the 38, and that's my effective cutting angle. And when you get into road woods, uh, things with knots, uh, some really bad woods, you might want to use a 50 degree or a 50 degree tooth. I found this 38 works best for me for what I do. And here's that Norris adjuster. Right there. That little thing. It rotates back and forth. Has a fine machine screw so there's no slop or slack. Uh, that little post fits down in that iron about as good as 20th century uh, machining can get you today. This is called A2 steel, which I happen to like. It uh, has a Rockwell of about 62. Anybody know what Rockwell is? Hardness. Right. Uh, there's something to be said about the A1, but I'm, we're not going to get into that. So, with all those features, the best way I can explain this tool when I got it in the mail, I did something I've never done before. All the planes that I've owned, collected, seen, demonstrated, and so forth, I said, let's see how it works coming out of the box. Anybody ever had one work out of the box? That's yeah, what I thought. the exact same tool you got. That's exactly <laughs> what I thought. Normally, you still have to do things to them. So I took it out of the box, and I did two things. I closed the mouth down and I adjusted the iron where it barely took a shaving and I ran it down a 12 inch piece of curly cherry that was 12 inches wide. And guess what guys? After about three or four little turns on my Norris adjuster, I got a shaving all the way down. 
and I mean, I must have my, my chin hit my breastbone right there because I had to go to the doctor. I thought it broke, broke it. So I thought, okay, the ultimate test. Let's see how it does on end grain. So I flipped the board up. It was 12 inches wide. Again, I had to make a couple of adjustments because I was just a little too heavy for what I was trying to accomplish on my end grain, and I actually got a shaving. I had not touched the iron at all. All I'd done is closed it down. So, the young man in the back, this is a, another one. So I come to believe, and this will end this, uh, bevel up, adjustable mouth. If it has those things, and it's well made, and almost all of the planes are well made today. They're well machined, they're heavy cast iron, the has cast iron is cured, I won't even get into that. This, if you try it, <coughs> will blow your mind. It's just a joy to use because it's adjustable mouth, has the Norris adjuster, it's just got everything. Those are Lee Nelson's? Veritas. These are, yeah, Lee Valley's. Um, now, that's just my personal opinion. You may disagree with it 100%. Any questions? How much are each of those planes? Uh, this one today is about 250 bucks. Uh, I think 1250 to ship. Uh, and this one comes in right and a left. Uh, it's patterned after the Stanley 140. Uh, the side came off of the 140 so that you could get up uh, in a, like a rabbit and clean out the edge. Uh, these are about 200 bucks. And who makes those? Lee Valley makes these. Okay. But remember now, if you're an, I would say if you're a reasonably accomplished woodworker and you want to start changing tools, then think expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I know Mickey over there, he's got these two-bit chipping car knives. Oh, uh, I see him. He's getting puffed up over there. 27 bucks. How many? 27. I hate, I hate that. <laughs> I hate that. Particularly, uh, you're such a great chip carver. Go ahead. I have a question. Going back to your the coping saw and the other saw, um, you do those um, dovetails by hand. Have you done dovetails with the uh, routers and the, the dovetail jigs and stuff like that? Once. I did about 300 of them for cabinet. <coughs> that was uh, 40 years ago. Uh, what I find, we don't have him here. We have a, cat, uh, a guy over in the uh, Atlanta Woodworkers Bureau. His name's Ken. <laughs> Big, tall, thin guy. And he makes boxes. That's what he makes. And he uses a router to do those funny double... Uh, you should hear him talk about that. Uh, you go out and you spend five or seven hundred dollars for one of these things and you take it home and it's an epiphany. Because you start crying after about three days because it doesn't work. It does, you just don't know how to use it yet. And get somebody like uh, Ken Slaughter to tell you about what it takes. It takes a lot of practice. So all the, all the power tools are the same way. All the hand tools are the same way. Gentlemen? Yeah? If you had one of those hand saws and it had some rust on it, what would be the best? Take some 4-0 uh, steel wool <coughs> and some um, WD-40. Scrub it with the grain, you'll see the direction. And don't try to take all of the patina off. If I had tried to turn this into a new saw, I would have ruined it totally. Not from a use standpoint, but from a collector standpoint. You can clean too much. All the hand saws are Say again? Are there any value, collector values to the 1950 hand um, saw? Buck Rogers saw maybe. That. Actually, you would think, I've seen those, several of them, brand new in the box. The collectors just don't care for them, even though, you know, they'll own one because it's they got it dirt cheap. The answer really is no. Uh, you need to get back uh, before 1900. And the better the condition the saw is in, the more it's worth, uh, particularly the handle. 
Um, I'll tell you a quick little story. I got a friend here in town that paid two thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars for a handle. The handle. That's what I said. I mean, you got to be kidding me. He and another guy got in a bid war. Yeah. Is there any kind of uh, coating that you put on a plane that you're going to? Don't use them that frequently, but you want to make sure they stay in good condition. Yes, there he is. Uh, Renaissance wax. Yeah, Renaissance wax. It's very expensive. Do not leave the lid off of the can. Uh, but it's uh, the way the molecular structure works in that stuff. It's used in uh, museums, big museums. Uh, when you put it on, take it right off because when it dries, it can be a real problem. Uh, and it'll last, what, about 40 years before it finally oxidizes and... I, I coat my table saw top with it. You know, I don't do, yeah, as, any. I, I don't do as much as I used to uh, recently, but, uh, you know, two, three times a year. But I bought a can at Highland Hardware about 25 years ago. Me too. And I got about half of it left. Me too. <laughs> Lasts forever, but don't yeah. leave the top off. And, and that, Furniture wax or something like that. It'll it's work. Good. It won't last as long. Uh, wears off real quick. Yeah. Uh, here's a good trick. You're cutting dovetails with your saw and you know your saw starts to pull a little bit, wax it. It'll be just like it'll cut hot butter after that. Yeah. It won't last forever, but the Renaissance wax will last longer than any of the waxes I've tried. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Thank you. My I'm going to give you a t-shirt. Sure. Sure. Uh, 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 uh,